Hey, it's Ryan over at Two Minute Tennis, and in this video, I'm explaining proper tennis technique on the forehand, one-handed backhand, two-handed backhand, and serve. All right, so before we can talk about technique, we need to understand how to hold the racket. And so we wanna learn about the hand and the bevels on your grip. So first, your hand. We have two spots, the base knuckle of the index finger and the heel pad. You wanna learn those spots because those two spots are gonna go on a certain bevel on the racket. Now, when you're learning about the bevels, you always wanna put the racket on its edge. That gets the orientation correct. And what we're looking at here is an octagon. 360 divided by eight, each bevel is around 45 degrees different than the previous bevel. So the top bevel, the top flat side, is bevel number one. And then when we're, when we're right-handed, we're gonna to count to the right. Lefties count to the left. I'm right-handed, I'm gonna to count to the right. So this is bevel one, bevel two, three, four, five is the very bottom, and so on. If you are left-handed, bevel one is the same as the righties. This is number two, three, four, and five. Bevels one and five are the same for both righties and lefties. So let's talk about the forehand grip first. We're gonna take those two spots and put them on one of two bevels, bevels three and four. Bevel three is the eastern forehand grip, like Fetter. Bevel four is the semi-western forehand grip, think Djokovic. Now, you can try both. The eastern forehand grip tends to hit a slightly flatter ball. Flatter means not as much spin. The ball can go a little faster, and players tend to hit the ball deeper in the court with that grip. The semi-western grip is the knuckle and heel pad on bevel number four, and that tends to add more spin to the ball, and that makes it so you can hit higher over the net and the ball still comes down in the court. I personally use a semi-western forehand grip, which is my knuckle and heel pad on bevel number four. So that's what I'm gonna be using in this demonstration, but you can really use either. I'm not a fan of the full western grip. You might be asking, what about the full western grip? The full west western grip is on the very bottom. I'm not a fan of it because I think it has too many limitations for amateur players. So bevel number four is what I'm gonna be using in this demonstration for the forehand ground stroke. So I've got the Top Spin Pro here. I'm gonna be using this for the demonstrations of the ground strokes. I am an affiliate, I love this product. If you would like to pick one up for yourself, if you're a coach, if you're a parent, if you're a player, especially for at home practice as I'm doing here in my basement, it is fantastic. So, and obviously on court as well. So please check out the link in the description below that is my affiliate link and pick yourself up one. So with the forehand ground stroke, there are six checkpoints. Checkpoints are places, let's say you film yourself hitting a forehand, and they're places where you can stop the video at a certain moment in the swing and look for certain things. So let me show you the six checkpoints first, and then we'll go through each one. So the first checkpoint is the ready position. The second checkpoint is unit turn. Then there's the drop, contact, extension, and since the ceiling's a little low here, I'm gonna choke up and then go finish. So those are the six checkpoints. Ready position, unit turn, drop, ex I'm sorry, contact, extension, and then the finish. So let's go over each one quickly. So first is the ready position. I'm a big believer in having a great ready position. Don't have a starting position, don't have a waiting position. Have a ready position. Each checkpoint's job is to help the next checkpoint be correct, like dominoes standing up, and you knock them over. Each domino's job is to knock over the next domino. So if your ready position is awesome, then it's so much easier for the beginning of the take back and the backswing to be correct as well. So what makes a great ready position? First, have a wide stance, knees bent, athletic movement comes from this position. Have your elbows out away from your body. I personally like to wait in my forehand grip, and since I am a two-hander, I like to wait with both hands on the grip. That way I'm ready for both a forehand and a backhand. My top hand is already on the racket. So one thing that I wanna stress here is when your elbows are out in your ready position, it's great because it tends to make the swing a little smaller. When players have their elbows in, that's when they can take a swing that really becomes very large and can take a lot of time to create, both on the forehand and the backhand. So elbows out in your ready position, it's especially great on a return of serve. Helps shorten the backswing so you can handle a faster serve. 
So as soon as you see the ball is about to be hit, you're gonna split step. And then when the ball is on its way, the moment you see that it's coming to the forehand, you should begin the take back and you're gonna do it with both hands. You're gonna turn with your elbows out, taking the racket back with two hands. You'll notice the head of the racket and my head, it's like two-headed monster, two heads are better than one. You don't wanna take the racket down, I don't want you taking the racket way up here. Take the racket more back where the racket head is similar to your head level. That's an efficient take back. And you're gonna do that the moment you see the ball comes off of your opponent's racket. Now that doesn't mean you have to go fast. You don't, to, you don't have to go really fast on the take back. The take back can be easy when you leave early, like leaving your house early for work. When you leave early, you get to take your time. That's why when you watch high level players, I had somebody in social media, they asked me, why does it look like the pros swing so slowly, yet they hit the ball so hard? It's because they're not rushed. Most amateurs wait for the ball to get to them, then they take the racket back. It's like leaving your house really late. What do you have to do? You have to drive really fast and then you crash. Like you gotta leave early. So the moment you see the ball come off your opponent's racket and you see that it's gonna be a forehand, begin the take back early. You'll be on time, you'll be relaxed and you'll feel more confident. So we're in our ready position for checkpoint one. Have a great ready position. Don't look like this. Look athletic with your elbows out, racket up. When the ball comes to you on the forehand, if you have both hands on the grip, you can slide the left hand up to the throat of the racket. You can even have the index finger on the strings and your elbows are out and then you're moving into position to get into the shot or into position to hit the ball. Now, when you are ready to hit and swing, what you wanna think of is a, what's called a three-point landing. There are three things that are gonna happen at the same time. Your body is gonna drop as you step as the racket goes down. So you're gonna turn as a unit, everything going back, and then you're gonna go down as a unit. It's why I don't call it the racket drop. I just call it the drop. Checkpoint number three is the drop because everything's going down, not just the racket, your body as well. And when you drop the body and drop the racket, you also are then gonna step out with that front foot. Now I understand sometimes you're gonna use an open stance, sometimes you're gonna do a mogul stance. There are many different stances. We're talking about the basic bones and structure on the forehand ground stroke, including the neutral stance, stepping forward into the ball. I watched a fantastic video today on Instagram of Zverev hitting a forehand, and it was a perfectly timed three-point landing. It was awesome. In fact, I saw him hit three or four forehands, and all but one were a neutral stance, stepping into the ball with that front foot. <laughs> the pros aren't just always hitting open stance. You gotta understand a true, um, old school neutral stance to actually hit your biggest and hardest forehands. So when we drop the body and we step out, we also wanna understand one really important concept, and that is that the string should be tilted down. Many amateurs struggle hitting topspin, they struggle with consistency, because when they drop the racket, the racket is on edge. If I had a coin right now, I could balance it on the edge of the racket. You don't want that because from the side view, when the racket is on its edge in the back, the racket ends up open at contact. When the racket is on its edge in the back, the racket's open when you get to the ball, which forces you to have to kind of turn the racket to try to get it square at contact. And it's so difficult to time and it's why players struggle with consistency when they don't close the racket face. So what you wanna do is tilt the strings down. Anywhere from 30 degrees to 45 degrees would be great. It definitely depends on which grip you use. The more semi-western, the more closed your racket will be naturally just because changing the grip changes the racket face. But if you can get the racket about 45 degrees closed and below contact, you can see my racket is closer to the ground than the ball. That will allow me to swing up to contact, which obviously is checkpoint number four. So you're gonna turn with your elbows out, racket similar height to your head, and then when you drop, you're gonna drop the racket down lower than the ball, and it, but it's gotta be closed for consist consistency. So then we're gonna swing up and out. You can see how this is called an inside out swing. My racket is close to me and I'm gonna swing out away from my body. Many players swing across 
because they swing outside in and the ball gets side spin and they can't pull the ball down with top spin. So you wanna swing from close to your body to away from your body and you'll notice I'm coming up to contact. I don't want you staying down to hit the ball. I want you coming up with your body. Using the legs, using this portion, this link from, from your foot to your knee and it, throughout the kinetic chain just gives you more energy to press against the ground and transfer it into the ball. So we're coming up to contact, we're brushing up the back of the ball and I can show you this with the Top Spin Pro. The beauty of the Top Spin Pro is you can see the ball spinning. So as you are hitting the ball, we are rolling. We're not just hitting the ball, we are rolling and we're getting that ball to spin. That puts high pressure on the top of the ball, low pressure on the bottom, and it, pull, it actually pushes the ball down into the court. So we drop down below the ball, we brush up the back, and this is where we wanna go up. After contact, it's important that you feel like, and here I've got a ceiling, it's important that after contact, you feel like you're going to the ceiling. You don't want to swing across. The tennis court is only 19.6 degrees wide. And what do I mean by that? From the corner of the singles court to the corner of the singles court when I'm at the baseline. So I've got 360 degrees all around me, but from the corner to the corner of the other side, you know, the corners of the singles courts, I only have 19.6 degrees to hit into. I can't be swinging around my body and hit my most consistent shots. I want to swing more like a Ferris wheel than a merry-go-round. A merry-go-round will hit the ball all over the place. That's why we don't go bowling like this. We go bowling like this, right? We're trying to go toward our target because a bowling alley is so narrow. A tennis court isn't as narrow as a bowling alley, but it's pretty darn close because we are, we are having to hit the ball in such what feels to be a very narrow area. Again, it's less than 20 degrees wide. For perspective, a baseball field, the lines on, in baseball is 90 degrees. Tennis, less than 20 degrees. So when you're hitting the ball, we want to be going up. Not only does this promote actual topspin and pure topspin, but it also promotes hitting the ball forward and not pulling it off to the side. So I have a ceiling here. I'm just going to embrace this. I'm not going to hit the ceiling hard, but I'm going to, after I contact the ball or brush and roll the ball, I'm going to go up to the ceiling. And notice I'm trying to go up to the ceiling above the ball. I'm not going to hit and then touch the ceiling over here. I'm going up as I hit. You can only get topspin by going up as you hit the ball. I mean, I guess I should say it this way. You can only get topspin and get it over the net by doing this. I mean, you can hit topspin by coming across this way, but the ball's just gonna roll into the, into the net. Yes, it had topspin, but it didn't help you be consistent and enjoy tennis more. So we wanna be going up toward the ceiling after you hit the ball. And then you're gonna catch the racket slightly behind your head, and I want you to notice I'm having to look up to see my hands. That's checkpoint number six, this is the finish. I'm catching the racket in my non-hitting hand. So I started the swing from checkpoint one to checkpoint two with two hands, and then checkpoint three and four were one-handed, and then the extension and then the finish were two-handed as well. So this is what I call the two-one-two two formula on the forehand. It's two, one, two. So the swing begins two-handed, and it ends two-handed. When you start hitting forehands that way, you get a lot more consistency. Let me show you this from the back view, and then we will go to the one-handed backhand. So here's ready position, checkpoint one, checkpoint two. You can see my back elbow's up, my right armpit is exposed because my elbow's up as the elbow drops, and the racket can get on the other side of my body, which can make it more difficult to be consistent. So my elbow is up, both hands are on the racket. I then drop the body and I step out and I drop my racket down, tilting the strings down about 45 degrees. I then swing up, brushing. I hope you can see this, this ball is spinning. So it's promoting hitting topspin. I'm swinging up, I'm gonna choke up so I don't put a hole in the ceiling. I'm swinging up as I hit the ball and then I finish. The more we swing up, 
the more the ball spins down. So if you find yourself not as consistent hitting forehands as you'd like, be sure you're swinging up more and more steeply. That's gonna put more spin on the ball. It's gonna arc the ball over the net, but then pull the ball back down. All right, that's the forehand ground stroke. So now let's go to the one-handed backhand. So we're talking about these two spots again, base knuckle and heel pad, and now we've got our racket on its edge. Same thing here, one, two, three, four, five, same numbers, but now here's a cool little way to remember it. When you're a one-handed backhand, put these two spots on bevel one. One-handed backhand puts the two spots on bevel one. That's the very top. So there is bevel number one. It's the very top flat bevel. I take my heel pad on my knuckle and I place it on bevel number one. On the one-handed backhand, there are five swing checkpoints. Again, these are places that if you film yourself, and you should be filming yourselves, if you film yourself hitting a ground stroke or a serve or any shot, you should be able to stop the video at certain points, scroll through and go, okay, stop. At this moment, I should see these things. In my experience, players often watch video, but they don't know really what to look for, or it's a little random. You wanna go in that order. You wanna go from the first checkpoint to the second checkpoint. No different than dominoes fall from the first domino to the next domino. If, if one domino doesn't do its job, the other dominoes can't do its job. So you want each checkpoint to be right and you start from the beginning and you work your way through the stroke. So the ready position is going to be the same. So, because why? Because the ready position is, <laughs> is neutral. We don't know which way the ball is going. So if you're a one-handed backhand, then your non-hitting hand is going to be on the throat of the racket. It should be, because you don't want to be having both hands on the grip and then having to move your top hand and then change your grip. It's going to make you late on very fast balls, balls you have to rush, deep balls, balls you need to take off the rise. So I want you, if you were a one-hander, to have your non-hitting hand on the throat of the racket and put your index finger on the strings. It gives great racket head awareness with your top hand. The elbows are out. You can see the distance away from my body. No different than on the forehand. Remember, the ready position is ready for all strokes. So my elbows are out. I'm split stepping as my opponent hits the ball. The moment I see that the ball is coming to my backhand, I need to go to checkpoint number two. Then there's checkpoint number three, which is the drop. Checkpoint number four, which is the contact. And checkpoint number five, which is the extension. Right, so those are the five checkpoints. And let me go through them again and then I'll go through each one in a little more detail. Ready position, unit turn, drop, contact, extension. All right, so the ready position is the same. As soon as we see the ball come off our opponent's racket, we are going to, like we are grinding pepper, we are gonna turn the racket and turn the hand at the same time. It's another way of saying it is, push your palms away. So when you change the grip, you're gonna push your palms away. You're gonna be turning the racket with your top hand and moving your hand, obviously, with the bottom hand. So as soon as the ball has hit you on and you see it's a one-handed backhand, you're gonna change the grip and you're gonna get your racket in what's called the unit turn, which is a couple things. One, you can see the racket head as I went back was similar to my height. Right? So I didn't go down on the way back, and I didn't go way up here. The turn is very neutral. It's very medium. It's not low. It's not high. It's medium. My arm is extended. Right? So I know that Federer, when he turns for the backhand, and his arm is bent. I get it. But realize, it, you, you can't hit a backhand with a bent arm like that. It's going to have to straighten by the time you contact the ball. And if you're struggling with consistency, on your one-handed backhand, all that's doing is making you have to calculate one more thing. We're not Michael Jackson doing the beat it dance where we're gonna make this move like we're dealing cards. It's not what we want. We want this arm extended in the back and then the only thing that has to move is the shoulder. It's less, uh, fewer, it's fewer calculations for you to have to worry about, makes it easier to be consistent. When I turn, because my elbow is up in my ready position, it's going to stay up and help my racket be vertical. 
Watch this from the back. Watch this from the back. When I turn, if my elbow's down, then my racket's gonna turn like this. This is so common. We want this elbow up so that the elbow and the hand of our non-hitting hand are level. You can see really from my hand to my elbow to my shoulder is all the same height. This is what we typically see as coaches in amateur tennis. We don't want this position. Then you just swing across and you're not gonna be consistent. You want the elbow up and the racket very vertical. You can see my strings are facing the crowd. Point your strings to the crowd is the idea. So the elbows are out. I turn the moment my opponent hits the ball. And I've already changed the grip, by the way. I don't know if you even noticed that. The grip change is hidden. The grip change happens really right at the beginning of the turn. Grip changes take no time. You can change your grip in no time whatsoever. So you change the grip and you go all the way back. Now this is the position where you're moving around trying to figure out where to stand to contact the ball. Similar to the forehand, here is where we're then gonna do that three-point landing again. Our body's gonna go down, the racket's gonna go down, and the front foot is gonna step forward. Most one-handed backhands are gonna be hit stepping into the ball, either a neutral stance or a closed stance. It's just the nature of the shot, stepping into the ball and blasting it. It's just the easiest way to hit a consistent backhand. One more thing to notice when I drop the racket. Yes, I'm closing the racket face. I'm tilting the strings down, just like on the, the forehand ground stroke, as I mentioned earlier. But I want you to notice how both hands are still on the racket. Yes, it's called a one-hander, but the one-hander is two-handed for a long time prior to contact. You're only gonna let go with that non-hitting hand from here and only from checkpoint number three to checkpoint number four prior to contact is the swing one-handed. It was two-handed here, it was two-handed here, and it's two-handed here. You want your non-hitting hand still on the racket at this point. Look at Federer, this is exactly what he does. His, his left hand, since he's right-handed, his left hand is still on the throat of the racket when his left hand gets to his left leg. And this is vital because this is what then allows the left arm to then go back later on to become a counterweight, keeping your body sideways, the racket tracks out towards your target, and you're much more consistent. What I see in my lessons with one-handers is they let go at the top of the swing. When the racket begins to drop, that's when they let go, and then the left hand comes forward. Sure, if you're Vavrinka and you can get away with that, that back arm coming forward <laughs> very early the way he hits it, then, then that's fine. I'm, I'm really happy for you. If you're the 99.9% .9 of tennis players around the world who can't do that, then you want to do what Federer does, which is the non-hitting hand stays on until the left leg, or if you're right-handed, it's your left leg, and that's when it's then going to start to go back. Now, let's talk about the contact. It's going to be very similar to the, the forehand. We're below the ball, our racket is closed, and then we're going to come up with our body and brush. We are spinning this ball, going from below the ball to above the ball, getting the ball to rotate. During this time, we are moving our non-hitting arm back as a counterweight. When my right arm, since I'm right-handed, is going forward and my non-hitting arm, my left arm, is going back, that keeps my body very neutral. It allows my racket to swing out toward the target. One last position, and I'm actually going to grab my daughter's racket for this because I want to be able to put my racket up high with the exact position that you want to use when you're on the court. So I want to show you what is called the left side, well, I mean, if you're right-handed, it's called the left side of the letter V. So I had my ready position, I turn right away, I've already changed my grip, hand, elbow, shoulder, all the same height, tip of the racket is pointing up, strings to the crowd. I drop my body, I drop the racket, I step with my front foot. Now watch, watch the finish. See how my racket is tilted to the left? The racket's not up and it's not over to the right. The racket is over to the left. And the reason is simple. The relationship between my arm and the racket at contact then shows up in the finish. Now I know you'll see Vavrinka like this and Gasquet and you'll see Dimitrov, I'm not even that flexible. Like he, he basically like touches his arms behind him. It's amazing how flexible his shoulders are. But if you're looking for massive consistency and accuracy 
and where you feel like, oh my gosh, I can hit the ball exactly where I want it to go. I, I'm sure that's a feeling you've been striving for on your one-handed backhand. Then finish in the left side, if you're right-handed, the left side of the letter V. If you are left-handed, it's gonna be the right side of the letter V. And I just mean literally the letter V, right? So when you finish, you're gonna finish, here's the letter V, you're gonna finish in the left side of the letter V. Again, that means that you didn't flick your wrist, you didn't cast the racket, you didn't roll the forearm. This means that your strings face your target for a really long time. Look at the pros. When they blast a down the line um, return, I'm sorry, a, a down the line passing shot, when they hit a return of serve, they do not let the wrist fly the way they do on a very slow ball they're way, where they're way behind the baseline, they're just gonna crush the ball. It's not, they really shorten up the follow through to gain accuracy and they keep the racket on the appropriate side of the letter V. So from the back, elbows are out, split step as your opponent hits. This is checkpoint one, checkpoint two, look for these in your swings. Checkpoint three, close the racket face, so important. Checkpoint four and checkpoint five. Body is sideways, non-hitting arm is back, my racket's up, left side of the letter V. If I'm looking at my opponent, I'm looking at my opponent or my ball under the racket. It's called the archway. You could even walk under your racket. So have the appropriate side of the letter V. So now we're gonna talk about the two-handed backhand. Let's go over the checkpoints. You're gonna recognize these from the forehand that we already went over. So I've got the ready, what am I doing? <laughs> We've got the ready position, unit turn, drop, contact, extension, and I'm gonna choke up and finish. So checkpoint one, checkpoint two, checkpoint three, four, five, and six. Again, those are places you wanna find in your own swing. You know, take notes, watch this video over and over again and understand what each checkpoint looks like and compare your swing to what the pros are doing. So, the grip. When it comes to the two-handed backhand, remember on the one-hander, I explained that the two spots are on bevel number one, right? But for the one-hander, the two spots are on bevel number one. Well, on the two-hander, the two spots are on bevel number two. So if you're a lefty, it's here. If you're a righty, it's here. So one-handers put their knuckle and heel pad on bevel one. Two-handers put their bevel, uh, their knuckle and heel pad on bevel two. It's just a really easy way to think of it. So that's, and by the way, that's not why those are the grips. <laughs> um, it just happens to be a funny coincidence. So I'm gonna take my knuckle and my heel pad and put them on bevel number two. So I'm starting in my semi-Western grip. That means I'm, I'm gonna have to change my grip to bevels. I'm changing my knuckle and heel pad from bevel four over to bevel number two. And you can see that I'm turning the racket. No, I'm not just moving my hand the whole distance. I'm moving my hand halfway and turning the racket the other half so the knuckle and heel pad and the bevel kind of meet in the middle. That way I'm not having to feel awkward like my arm is doing all the work. I'm actually gonna, like I'm grinding pepper, I'm gonna have both hands do a little bit of the work to meet in the middle. So. The ready position, the same as the forehand and the one-hander. My elbows are out. If you're a two-hander, both hands are on the grip. Remember, one-hander, this is your ready position. Two-hander, both hands should be on the grip. Split step as your opponent hits. The grip change happens really fast. Look at my elbows, they're out, right? <laughs> you let your tennis instructor smell your armpits. Please don't play tennis like this. Get your elbows out. As soon as you see that it's a backhand, you're gonna change the grip and you're gonna go all the way back. This is 180 degrees back for the unit turn. I'm moving in this position. Racket head and my head, a similar height. You'll notice I didn't go up to get here. I didn't go down to get here. Shortest distance is just gonna be straight back. Get the racket back and then we can drop and swing through. So this is the position we're then moving to get into contact. You'll notice my back elbow is up. When my, if I'm hitting the ball this way, when my back elbow is up, my racket's very vertical. I wish I had a coin, but if I had a coin, I could place it right on the tip of the racket and it would balance. 
As my elbow drops, the racket opens. Remember, when my racket falls, it needs to close. We, re we remember that from the forehand and the one-handed backhand. So as my racket falls, it has to close. So I want it to be on edge to make it easy to close. If my elbow is dropping and my racket's open, even if I drop my racket, it's only gonna get on edge. If I'm open, if I close it, it only gets on edge. If it's on edge here, when I close it, it actually closes, which is what I want. I want the strings to be closed in the back so the strings face forward at contact. Remember, when the racket's on its edge in the back, it'll be open. When the racket is tilted down at about 30, 45 degrees in the back, that's when the strings will face forward, the ball goes forward, you're brushing low to high to get the top spin, and you're super consistent. Same thing with the drop as the forehand and two-handed backhand. I'm gonna drop my body, drop my racket down with the closure, and I'm stepping out. Those three things all happen at a similar time. I'm getting below the ball, I'm engaging my lower body, and now I'm gonna come up to contact. I'm lifting up with my body and I'm brushing up the back of the ball. The checkpoints on the two-handed backhand are so similar to the forehand. I'm then swinging up and out, and I'm gonna show you this from the back. I can actually use the same checkpoint number five as the one-hander, which was that left side of the letter V if you're right-handed. You'll notice I'm brushing up the back, I'm going up toward the ceiling, but watch my finish here, I should say the extension. Notice the racket is tilted to the left. I'm not doing that just because the ceiling is low. This is what you see Djokovic do. On, I would say 70, 75% of the backhands, Djokovic hits. His racket as it comes up is staying to the left of his hands. And then he brings the racket in over his head like this. You won't see Djokovic let the racket tip fly over here. By doing this, he's super consistent. It's one of the, one of the reasons why his backhand return, return of serve is so good. So he's below the ball, you're coming up, you're brushing, you're spinning the ball, the racket stays to the left of your hands, and then the finish is just like the forehand where the hands are higher than the eyes. So checkpoint one, notice you can see my elbows. Checkpoint one, I've already changed my grip. Checkpoint two, checkpoint three, close the racket from below contact. Checkpoint four, swing away from the body and brush. It's the only true way to get pure topspin. Brushing up the back, you're gonna rotate the body as you do this. Your racket's gonna be to the left of your hands if you're right-handed, and then the racket finishes over the head. All right, this is such an awesome product. <laughs> Check the link below and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll absolutely love the Topspin Pro. So I'm getting my birthday hat for one of the checkpoints. Oh, let me show you the grip real quick. So on the serve, we have the two spots. It's the same grip as the two-handed backhand. It's bevel number two, this slanted 45 degree angle bevel if you're right-handed. If you're a lefty, it's this bevel right here. So I'm gonna take those two spots, put them on bevel two, heel pad and knuckle. Again, I've got my trigger finger. And let me go over the, I'm gonna use my daughter's racket again. I'm gonna go over the seven serve checkpoints. I'll show it to you from the side and from the back. So checkpoint number one is the ready position. Checkpoint number two is called palm down. Checkpoint three is knock off the birthday hat. Checkpoint number four is called on edge. Checkpoint, I'm gonna duck down a little bit. Checkpoint number five, normally I'd be extending up, way up into the air at this point. Checkpoint number five is the contact. Checkpoint number six is pronated. And checkpoint number seven is the finish. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. From the back, it looks like this. Checkpoint one, checkpoint two, checkpoint three, checkpoint four, five, I'm gonna duck down again, checkpoint six, and checkpoint seven. Okay, so we've got our grip. You've got a ball, you're gonna serve. I'm, right now I'm gonna serve, uh, I'll serve this way, so you can watch it from the side. The very first position always starts with the feet, the ready position of the serve. It always starts with the feet. 
So the back foot is going to be parallel to the net. The front foot is going to be angled in, and I don't like when players have their back foot way behind. When they have their back foot way behind, like Federer. I know Federer, you know, third, all, you know, third most aces of all time, 20 Grand Slams, but it truly gives a false sense of coiling in your serve when your foot is way behind. So what I like to tell people is have the feet more in line like you are on a skateboard where the toes are really lined up to your target. Obviously, you don't want your back foot, if you're right-handed, <laughs> you don't want your back foot over to the right. But I would say more in line with each other is gonna be better than having it way back. Again, if it's way back, you're actually not coiling. Coiling is when your upper body turns more than the lower body. When your lower body's turn this much, man, it's really tough to coil on top of that. So to get a better coil, kind of like a baseball pitcher or a quarterback, a football quarterback, in order to get that coil, we actually benefit from having the feet where the toes are more in line with each other. Our weight is gonna be our, on our front foot. We can bounce the ball a couple times and we're gonna rest the racket on the ball. Don't start with your hands separated. Rest the racket on the ball. Being relaxed, the more weight, I know it. the rackets are so light, I get it, but the less your right arm, if you're right-handed, the less your hitting arm has to do the more relaxed it can be and loose. You don't want to be engaging the muscle to hold the racket. You definitely don't want to be tight. You want to be loose and relaxed. That's checkpoint number one, basic ready position. W one thing as well, you'll notice my strings are facing slightly up. I'm a big fan of having the racket slightly up at the beginning of the swing. It just promotes using the proper grip. If you're a coach and you have students who are used to using a forehand grip and you're trying to move them to the continental chopper grip uh, for the serve. One quick tip for them is to actually ask them to wait with their strings pointing up. They're so used to the strings pointing down that when you put them in the proper grip, they start turning, their, their brain says, no, 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 we need the strings to face down. They have to learn that the different grips actually change where the strings face. So have the student start with their racket slightly open. Doesn't have to be like Edberg and Raonic, but just slightly open like Federer is gonna be fine. So that's checkpoint number one. Checkpoint number two is called palm down. Now, to get there, you want to turn the body and coil, much like a baseball pitcher or a, you know, a quarterback. We want to turn the body. Remember, our feet were on a skateboard, so when we turn, we actually are coiling, and that coil then turns into an uncoil later on. So we turn the body, and then from here, we wanna bring the arms up not next to each other, where the ball and the racket are at the same height. But I don't want you scissoring your arms where the ball is going up as the racket's going down. That is so common. I want you to coil and have your arms come more up at the same time. If you look at Federer, he's very synchronized with his arms. As the ball is going up, his racket's coming up. Now the ball is leading, which I want you to do. And you want to do that because it forces your racket. It creates the environment for racket speed where the racket's got to speed up and, and catch up to the ball. But I don't want the racket going down as the ball goes up. I want you to turn and then toss and have the arms coming up at a similar time, leading with the ball. You'll notice as I'm coming up with the toss, I am having my racket where I could actually put a ball in the throat of the racket. This is where typically players, when they go into that waiter's tray, you know, that palm up position that you don't want to be in, what typically happens is players go across their feet and at best, the racket is on edge. I don't want you to put your racket on edge. And I definitely don't want you to go across your feet and immediately point your strings to the sky. This is really my favorite position to teach on the serve. Remember, I'm serving this way. I'm serving that direction off to the right of the camera, which means the baseline is right here. Well, if you notice, I'm pointing the tip of the racket in checkpoint number two, this palm down position, the tip of the racket is pointing at the camera. I'm not pointing the tip of the racket at the back fence. Look at Federer, look at Kyrgios, look at Osaka. When they go across their feet and then they bring the racket up, the tip of the racket is pointing at the camera, the camera that's along the baseline. So this is how you get into that Jeff Salzenstein elbow the enemy position. That elbow is back because the tip of the racket is pointing at the camera. Again, I'm serving that direction. You are watching me from the side 
serve that direction. When I bring the racket up, the tip of the racket is pointing at the camera. Now my elbow is back. When the tip of the racket points at the back fence, now my elbow is down and I lose racket speed. You want the elbow back. That's the baseball quarterback position in order to hit, I, I don't mean a quarterback plays baseball, I just mean baseball pitcher and football quarterback position that you can get a lot of speed from. So what you wanna practice, I'm not gonna to toss because the ceiling is right here, but what you wanna practice is a, a toss and then stop right here where the strings are facing down. Watch that again. Checkpoint number one, I coil, I toss, my arms come up at a similar time, obviously the ball is leading, and the tip of the racket is facing the, the camera. Palm down, checkpoint number two. This is what leads to being able to use the proper throwing motion. Everyone's looking for that trophy pose that you hear on, on YouTube and, and Instagram and, and Facebook. Everyone's talking about the trophy pose, how to get into the trophy pose. About six years ago, I was teaching a group of kids. They were seven, eight years old, and they were all going palm up on their serve. And I said, look guys, I said, I got down to them, I said, look, unicorns cannot serve correctly. And they all laughed. I was like, no, it's true. Because unicorns would hit their horn with the racket. And I, I kind of thought, you know, how can I give them something to hit like a unicorn horn? And I thought of the birthday hat. And that's kind of how the birthday hat was born. It's kind of what I'm known for on, <laughs> online um, when, it comes to, when it comes to really all instruction. Everyone's like, oh, Ryan, the birthday hat guy. But when you toss the ball, and the tip of the racket faces the camera, not at the back fence, but at the camera that you have to the side of you. Again, I'm serving that direction. When you have your palm down, that's what allows the racket to then pass in over the head. The proper throwing motion on your serve will knock a birthday hat off of your head from front to back. So what you can practice, and it's a great drill, you can practice putting a ball in the throat of the racket and just go like this. This is one of my favorite drills for players just to learn that little hand wiggle that Vic Braden and Steve Smith always talk about. This move like this. The problem is when you're actually serving, you can't learn that. Like you can't be doing that. So you need something that's gonna give you instant feedback. So when you're serving, put a birthday hat on. This is not some just funny thing. This is an actual way to develop your best serves. Go out and get a birthday hat and practice your serve. And if you go palm up into the waiter's tray, you won't hit the birthday hat. If you're a coach, buy a bunch of these and hand them out to all of your players. And you just tell them, if you hit the birthday hat, you served like Fetter in Osaka. If you didn't, you served like Joe from down the street, you know? So you wanna learn that Fetter Osaka motion, the racket passing in over the head. So after you toss, checkpoint number three is knock off the birthday hat. At that exact moment, when we toss, our knees bend, at this exact moment, that's when our body explodes. So we turn, we toss, from this position we bend, and as we bend, we bring the racket to our Right to our birthday hat, and then as we hit the birthday hat, we begin the body exploding back up. That's the proper timing of the body exploding up. The proper timing that the body goes up is when the racket knocks off the birthday hat. Now from the back, again now I'm serving this way, from the back at this point, now because of our grip, our racket is gonna come around on edge. The proper grip puts the racket on edge prior to contact. You don't want to see this in your serve. You wanna see this prior to contact. The racket needs to look like an ax and you're gonna chop the ball in half. So we turn, we toss, strings face down, knock off the birthday hat, our body comes up. At this moment, we're also dropping the tossing arm. So the tossing arm stays up until we hit the birthday hat and then it begins to drop and it drops simultaneously with the racket. This arm drops with the racket going down and the body going up. The racket is on its edge. Now that, that it's on its edge, we can impart spin, but we can also fire the forearm and we can rotate and actually get speed. So we're on edge, we go up, we turn to contact, 
we're hitting flat for a first serve, or we can stay on edge and swing more off to the right and spin the ball, and then we turn and pronate. So that would be checkpoint number five and checkpoint number six. Checkpoint four is on edge. Then we go up to contact, and then we keep turning. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. If we don't turn and we just keep it on edge, we'll hit the frame of the racket. So as we turn, we keep turning. You'll see Sampras, Becker, when they were done, look at Isner, when he's done, I can't even be that flexible, but when they're done, not only were their strings facing off to the right, since they're right-handers, their strings are actually facing up. That's how loose and, and pronated they were in their um, position after contact. They turn as they hit, and the racket keeps turning. They turn to hit the ball, the racket keeps turning. This is checkpoint number six. Checkpoint number seven is the finish where it's called the power X. This is where your arm should be tucked in against your body. I tell people their tossing hand should smell like their hitting armpit. Or I'll, I'll say your left hand should smell like your right armpit if they're right-handed. This creates a reactive break. I see so many players, they worry about this left arm like Kyrgios and Ash Barty and, and, and Andy Murray and Andy Roddick. Uh, Dominic Team. I, I remember a video where Dominic Team was serving and he was like sticking his left arm out way up here. When you copy that, you're not copying what is truly important with that tossing arm after you release the ball. You don't need to worry about this. What you need to worry about is tucking it in against the body. And the reason is it's a reactive break. As remember, we talked about the coil, right? We coil and now we start uncoiling. But as we uncoil, we want to slow the body's rotation down. And we can do that by pulling this arm in. That stops the body and the racket fires. Think about when, um, if you're roller skating with someone and you're holding hands. If you wanna whip them forward, if you're both roller skating, the only way to whip them forward is for you to slow down. It's the law of conservation of energy. Energy is not created nor destroyed, it's only transferred. So in a system, you and, you and your friend holding hands are a system of energy right here. And so as you, if you wanna speed that person forward onto their, you know, around the rink, you have to slow down. It's the only way to give them energy. So when your body's rotating, when you stop your body's rotation, the racket actually fires so much faster. You don't want to be rotating as you're hitting a serve. You want to be rotating and then stop the rotation and that energy goes into the hitting arm and the racket goes so much faster. So the seven serve checkpoints are the ready position, palm down, so after you release the ball, make sure your strings are facing down. Lift the arm up, elbow is back, strings are facing down. Knock off the birthday hat, so go out and get a birthday hat and actually knock it off. As you knock off the birthday hat, that's when your body should start coming back up. The racket will be on edge, then it turns into contact. You can stay on edge and spin the ball to get side spin, or you can turn a little earlier and get nice and flat against the back of the ball. Then you are gonna pronate, and then you're gonna finish in the power X. I'll show you one more time from the back. Checkpoint one. Checkpoint two, checkpoint three, checkpoint four. I can't go up too high, but I'll hit the ceiling. Checkpoint five, checkpoint six, and checkpoint seven. Please refer back to this video often. I hope you were able to take notes. You can obviously watch the video again and take all the notes you need. But checkpoints make it really easy for amateur recreational players to have an eye of a coach to film themselves Look at the video and at certain moments, know what to look for to know that you have the most efficient uh, swings and technique possible. So thank you so much. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Please share this video with a friend. Please subscribe, hit that notification bell. It's the best way to support this channel. This is Ryan Reedy over at 2MinuteTennis.net and I'll see you in the next video.